Hey guys, it's Jacob from Living Healthy Every Day, and we've got a cool podcast for you today. Today, we're going to be discussing the thyroid, its regulatory cycle, and hormones on metabolism, how many organ systems affect the thyroid, and vice versa, and an ingenuitive way to monitor and regulate the thyroid. The thyroid. So, I'm here with Dr. Dennis Wilson. Thank you for being here, Dr. Wilson. Thanks, Jacob. Thanks for having me. That's great. Dr. Wilson developed the concept and protocol called Wilson's Temperature Syndrome. Uh, he's an author of many books, including Wilson's Temperature Syndrome, A Reversible Low Temperature Problem, uh, Doctor's Manual for Wilson's Temperature Syndrome, and the recently released uh, Evidence-Based Approach to Restoring Thyroid Health. He also speaks regularly at conferences throughout North America. So let's get started. Uh, let's go a little bit about uh, the thyroid's purpose and its physiology, what it does in the whole body. Why, why do we even have a thyroid and thyroid hormones? The um, purpose of thyroid hormones is to go into each cell of the body and into the nucleus of every cell of the body and tell the body how fast to transcribe DNA. Mm -hmm. So we all know DNA is the code of life. And so that's the purpose of thyroid hormone is to tell our bodies how fast to transcribe the code of life, or in other words, how fast to live. And so that that's the whole point of that's the whole point of the thyroid system. And if, if we're operating too slow or if our metabolic rate is too slow, we can have all kinds of problems, all kinds of symptoms, even death. And if our thyroid function or our metabolic rate is too high, uh, that could be life-threatening also. Mm -hmm. As far as um, where it starts or how it comes about, um, it's regulated in the pituitary gland. It determines the pituitary gland determines how much it detects whether the thyroid gland is supplying enough thyroid hormone. Mm -hmm. And if the thyroid supply is too low, it, the pituitary secretes something called TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone to encourage the body to make, or the thyroid to make more thyroid hormone or T4. But T4 is not the active thyroid hormone. The active thyroid hormone is T3. And 80% of the T3 is produced not in the thyroid gland, but produced in the cells throughout the body. So there's an enzyme called deiodinase that, that, transcri that um, um, converts T4 into T3. And then it's the T3 that goes into the nucleus and determines the metabolic rate. Mm -hmm. That's via D2? D deiodinase? Yeah. Okay. Yes. And then if it goes through with D3, it, gets into, it turns into reverse T3. Exactly right. So T4 can either be activated into T3 or deactivated into reverse T3. And that, whether it goes one way or the other, actually is under all kinds of regulation. It's, um, there's all kinds of pathways that are set up to regulate um, how much is converted one way or the other. And so that all happens inside the cells of the body. And that's why it's invisible to thyroid blood tests. So a lot of doctors have been trained to think, okay, let's see how well the thyroid system is working. And the way we're gonna determine that is by measuring, looking at the blood. Mm -hmm. But the blood isn't where this conversion happens. And it's not where the result ends up either. You know, because the result of adequate uh, T3 stimulation of the body um, results in adequate metabolic rate and Basically, the, the rate, the faster, the faster our body works, the warmer we get because it's uh, um, the speed, like speed is proportional to temperature. It's, it's kinetic energy, essentially. Exactly, yeah. exactly yeah. right. So like, and, and the, the kinetic energy, if you look at the formula for that, velocity is, a, is, a, is one of the variables in there. And so, you know, the, this, the, um, and temperature, temperature is a, a variable also. So really, the thermometer is a speedometer. And that's when you, when you have a thermometer outside in your, um, outside in, in your yard, and it's registering higher, what that means, literally what that means is that the molecules in the air around faster. Exactly. Yeah. And so then, um, so that way, and that's the same way it works in the body. The faster our bodies work, the faster, uh, the higher our temperature is going to be. And, and that's a, an exact measure of the metabolic rate. Mm -hmm. 
So what other uh, important factors are there to create T3? So well, there, th- go ahead. You, you need uh, iodine, right? And tyrosine? Yes. A uh, form um, of tyrosine. Yeah, there's um, – you to make – to make T3, you're going to have to have T4, mm-hmm. and to make T4, you're going to need iodine, like you mentioned. And in fact, the four on, of T4 means that what that what that uh, and the T, you know, stands for thyroid, but it, you know, tyrosine, tyrosine for iodide. Yeah, and yeah. So you've got you've got four iodine atoms attached to um, this uh, this uh, thyronine molecule. And that's what makes a T4, but a T3 only has three iodines on it. But yeah, you need iodine to make T4, and you need something called uh, deiodinase to convert the T4 to T3. And one of the important parts of deiodinase is selenium. Mm -hmm. Selenium is right in the middle of the active site of that enzyme. So you need selenium, zinc's important, iron's important. Magnesium is important for the for the health of the thyroid. The um, anyway, vitamin C. You want to keep down. You want to have antioxidants to decrease uh, autoimmune thyroiditis or inflammation in the thyroid. So there's a there's a lot of things that you know you can do to help your thyroid. Mm-hmm. If if uh, what's the mechanism to create T two? T two is. If you have, you mentioned that D3 enzyme, mm-hmm. you mentioned that D3 enzyme. Well, if you have D3 act on T4, it causes, it, it generates something called reverse T3. But if you have D3 act on T3, it, it creates T2. So, um, so that's one of the, so T2 for a lot of people think it's an inactive metabolite, but uh, other people believe, and um, I, I believe that it has some some activity, mm-hmm. uh, has some action. Um, it's not really on the market, can't really sell it as a supplement. It's considered a drug, but um, it's, uh, it's a good, it's a good, it's an interesting molecule, yeah. Yeah, I looked at some of the research on T2, but we'll talk about it later when we're talking about the organ systems. Okay. Um, so let's get into hypothyroidism. So okay. that's the uh, how much of the perce- percentage of the population has hypothyroidism? Well, that's a good, good, great question, and, and different people have different definitions for mm-hmm. hypothyroidism, and. Um, most most people would diagnose or they would define hypothyroidism as a high TSH, which indicates low thyroid hormone function or thyroid production. Mm-hmm. And a high TSH is a TSH. And even that's, um, some people would say it's over two or a TSH over three and a half or a TSH over four. But to answer your question, I would say probably 3% of people have a TSH higher than four. But... If you consider people that have TSH lower than four, that's not really "quote unquote" hypothyroidism, mm-hmm. and yet they still have all the symptoms of hypothyroidism. So what are the, some of the symptoms? So some of these listeners know. Okay, so you've got uh, fatigue, depression, dry skin, dry hair, fluid retention, PMS, anxiety, depression, easy weight gain, insomnia, migraines, carpal tunnel syndrome, arthritis. Um, uh, cardiovascular disease, hair loss, low sex drive, low ambition, low concentration. <laughs> Sounds like every symptom under, <laughs> under the sun. Yeah. There's literally dozens and dozens. And it's easy to see why because, again, we're talking about metabolic rate, which is the sum of all the chemical reactions in the body. And so, so literally, you know, when you have a slow metabolism, you have a slow everything in your body functions poorly. So yeah, it can cause pretty much every symptom known to man. So how does it re- regulate mood disorders and things like that? Well, people can uh, definitely have anxiety. They can definitely have depression. Um, I wouldn't, they actually have done studies to show that T3 is a better antidepressant than antidepressants are. <laughs> you know? 
Like you can take people that are failing on antidepressants and you can't find an antidepressant that works on them. And uh, you can put, put those people on T3 and half the time or more, you know, they're going to respond to that when, when they didn't respond to the others. So, um, it, you know, it helps. And there's some people with bipolar illness. Um, thyroid can be part of bipolar, bipolar disease can be definitely part of anxiety and panic attacks. So as far as the exact mechanism, you know, I would say that, you know, when the temperature's down, um, it, it, um, every enzyme in the body depends on its shape for its activity. And when they're too cold, they're too tight. And when they're too warm, they're too loose. But when they're just the right temperature, then they, they function the best. And, uh, and, when the temperature goes too low, I mean, it's basically affecting every enzyme in the body and every chemical reaction in the body depends on enzymes pretty much. <clears throat> so anyway, I, you know, there's literally hundreds, if not that, you know, I'm sure there's thousands of pathways in affecting mood disorders and every one of those could be affected by low temperature, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So what about things like uh, weight gain, uh, low thyroid weight gain? Yeah, there's, um, yeah, I mean, I've had patients who have low temperatures and they've tried everything known to man and their, their TSH is normal, but their temperature is low and they have all the symptoms. And it's the symptoms typically come on after stress and um, stress like childbirth or divorce or death of a loved one. And so they're fine. They go through some major stress and they gain a ton of weight and they can, they can never get it, get it off. And I've had this one lady, the, the most I ever saw a lady lose was um, we got her temperature up with uh, some T3 therapy. And within a month, she had lost like 35 pounds. And she hadn't changed really anything in her diet. So, and she was totally unrecognizable. And I've had patients lose over 100 pounds when they couldn't lose weight before. So, I mean, it, it, and I've also had people get their temperature up and they still didn't lose weight. So it's obviously not the whole story for every person, but you know, it's a huge factor for some people for sure. So T3 is working, it makes more brown fat, right? Um, it does, Let, let's see, I'm trying to remember the r r ratio. I think, I don't, I, I don't know that it makes more brown fat, but I, I do know that, um, I, I, I mean, I know brown fat metabol you know, has higher um, caloric expenditure, and uh, I, and I think it might be because it's more susceptible to T3, but uh, I don't know exact. I can't remember the exact connection there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from what I've read is that it increases um, uncoupling proteins. Yes, T3 is in increasing uncoupling proteins, which therefore in increases more brown fat. Oh, okay. So the more, so, it, so more T3, you get more brown fat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Converting white adipose tissue to brown adipose tissue. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. <laughs> How does uh, thyroid hormones work with bone diseases like osteoporosis or Paget's? Well, there's, um, there's, some studies, I mean, some people, like if you ask most doctors that, they'll say, okay, well, too much thyroid hormone will give you osteoporosis. But there's other doctors that would argue against that, saying that there's never been any conclusive evidence that thyroid hormones contribute to osteoporosis. Um, I have seen, I know a lot of people, a lot of doctors have given a lot of people T3 therapy. And I know for, you know, I haven't heard, and this has been for 20, 30 years, I haven't heard a lot of them saying, oh, my patients are all getting hip fractures and, you know, losing their bones. I haven't, I haven't heard that at all. But um, I, I've traced um, bone, bone health on a couple of my patients over, over time, like getting a bone scan every, every year on a couple of patients and I didn't see any bone loss. If anything, I saw some, some improvement in their bone density. Yeah. But that's because it's kind of, it's a little bit complicated, but basically the, the research that some people point to being thyroid being bad for bones was done with T4 mm -hmm. and it was done with T4 
um, without regard to temperature, without regard to clinical status, and just pushing people on T4 and leaving them there for 10 years on too much of the wrong medicine. And in my mind, that's the worst way to use thyroid medicine, is to give somebody suppressive doses of T4 to squash their TSH and pay no attention to how they're feeling. So on the other hand, giving somebody T3 to normalize their temperature and have all their symptoms go away to me is vastly different and they're vastly different and there's no studies on that. Yeah. Yeah. From what I've, I've researched is that, so T3 is increasing PPAR gamma and also uncoupling proteins. And those are correlated with increased levels of Vaspin, uh, which is a hormone that increases bone density. Uh, yeah. That and preptin. So, I've, I've from what I've the pathways from what I've researched it should technically help yeah with increasing well, that, density yeah well that would explain it because that that's been my um, experience I mean I can't say that I've done a lot of those uh, I haven't I haven't you know traced track that in a lot of people but the ones I've seen you know it looks pretty promising uh, what about um, thyroid hormones and hair hair loss yeah, that that can be a big deal, and it can also be frustrating because, um, I mean, the first thing, I mean, definitely I've seen people grow back, you know, their hair from 50% to 100% back to normal when they got their temperature up. I mean, uh, telogen hair loss, um, the number one cause of a, a specific kind of hair loss is um, is low low thyroid function. And so that could definitely explain it. Of course, it's not the only explanation. And it's really interesting, we were talking earlier, um, before we started the podcast, you were talking about inflammation and um, how that affects so many things. And hair loss is one of those things. And I thought I thought it was interesting that, um, so T3 is, is, is uh, very anti-inflammatory to, to, for a lot of people. So, I mean, it's and it'll reduce oxidative stress. It reduces inflammation, reduces insulin resistance, uh, re- you know, so reduces obesity. So, uh, and reduces hair loss in some people. So, I mean, that's one of the things that can that can turn it around for sure. But uh, what I was going to say about frustrating is, you know, it's not it's not always. It's not always the whole story. Sometimes you get somebody's temperature up and all their symptoms get better, but you know they're still not having as much luck with their hair as they'd like, even though the hair came on with all the other symptoms. And even though the other symptoms are gone, you know th- this can persist. Yeah, there's still some kind of chronic inflammation going. going yeah, on. yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. I just want yeah. to go through all the that how the T3 affects different systems. Uh, what about heart function? Um, cardiovascular, you know, T3 is at the very heart of the heart, <laughs> uh, heart of the cardiovascular system. I mean, it's it's definitely they've been they've shown that lower lower thyroid function can increase cardiovascular disease. And and uh, I was just I heard a story uh, yesterday or today about a, a man who had uh, really bad. He had already had a heart attack when he was 40, and he had a second one at 42, and his heart was just terrible. And, you know, he was on like 14 different medicines and the doctors, you know, had, you know, he was going to cardiologists and they were thinking, you know, he looked like he was going to die and he felt like he was going to die and he was just doing terrible. But, but then, um, his doctor took a look at him and, and, uh, uh, thought of a couple of things. One was iodine and one was thyroid. And he gave him those two things, and his his health sprang back completely. And he hasn't had he had had heart pain for 20 years. And yeah. getting started on the thyroid, he didn't have any heart pain at all. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, from from what I've seen, the mechanism or one of the mechanisms is that uh, I know T3 uh, activates stem cells in the heart. Uh, making it, protecting it, and essentially preventing like heart attacks and things like that, increasing yeah. its function. Awesome, amazing. Yeah, it's it's pretty awesome what it can do. Um, yeah. What about thyroid, uh, thyroid hormones and mitochondria function, mitochondrial function? Well, of course, uh, again, like um, the mitochondria is at the co- at the core of the power of the body and. Um, 
and T3 uh, does does affect that the way it affects everything else. When your T3 functions down or your thyroid function down, your mitochondrial health will suffer, and uh, you can get worn down. And you want you want to you want to have uh, enough thyroid um, supply to to refurbish your mitochondria and to get that autophagy that you need to you know restore your health and restore your function. So. Yeah, it's just otherwise you get gunked up and unhealthy. <laughs> yeah, it's it's definitely important to keep uh, the mitochondria working and and especially with uh, thyroid function working too. Yeah. So let's get into a little bit um, about dysfunction of the thyroid. So what what is causing the dysfunction? Some stressors uh, that will cause dysregulation so you okay. mentioned one before what was it childbirth yes and um, the uh, that would be the number one cause and when I, uh, I we probably should point out that when I talk when we talk about thyroid health I mean there's thyroid hormone there's the hor- there's thyroid hormone supply and then there's thyroid hormone conversion or utilization or expression and um, most doctors will look at one, they look at just one parameter when they're assessing your thyroid function and that's the TSH. So they're, effect, they're, they're checking out your supply and they're assuming your, conver- your, your expression or your, your conversion expression are fine. Mm-hmm. However, what I recommend is that we look, at, we look at the supply, we look at the TSH, but we also look at the temperature and the temperature shows you how the expression's doing and the and the TSA shows you how the how the supply is going. So, so what uh, the thing is is like some like childbirth doesn't necessarily reduce the supply. It doesn't really necessarily cause. I mean, in some cases it can. So some people can have a supply problem, and some people can have a conversion problem. And so yeah, some people have postpartum thyroiditis. Yeah, and that will decrease the. Um, production or the supply of thyroid hormone, but much more frequently, you asked me about the hypothyroidism and I said 3%. Well, there's some people that have a normal TSH, so they don't have hypothyroidism, but they have, still have a low temperature and they still have all the symptoms and that's reversible. I call that Wilson's temperature syndrome, but there are there are 10 times more people that have that. Like 30% of the people walking around out there and a lot of the people on this podcast, I mean, if any of you are having complaints, all you have to do is check your temperature. And if your temperature is running a degree below normal, then that's plenty to explain all kinds of symptoms. And there's, and, and, and maybe no one's told you that before, but it's still true. And so if you, and there's no reason you have to walk around with low temperature. And as long as you do walk around with low temperature, you have, you know, good reason to expect to feel bad because it doesn't feel good to have low temperatures. But anyway, so when you have the, when you have a stress like a, like a childbirth, that kind of definitely, the body goes through a stress and tries to slow down like a coping mechanism. But after the stress, it's supposed to come back up to normal and you're supposed to feel great again, but sometimes you don't. And sometimes you stay that way, yeah. and stuck in a vicious cycle. So, so anyway, the the childbirth is very common where a person will say, "Yeah, I was fine until my third baby, you know, and I got I had this baby, and I've never been the same. I felt tired. Um, I've become divorced. I'm tired. You know, I, I heard another story today of a lady who had a huge goiter. She had a normal TSH. She had a huge goiter." Um, she was on thyroid medicine. The doctors were all satisfied because her blood tests were fine, but she was um, depressed, tired. It's she could symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, they uh, when they took her when they took her temperature and changed her medicine from T4 to T3, her goiter went away. She her she got her life back. So wow, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. What what other stresses are there? Like? So divorce, mm-hmm. death of loved one, job or family stress, you know, um, uh, sometimes, you know, losing a dog or I had this one patient who um, he, he was a fireman and he had his father living with him. It was just him and his dad living there. 
and uh, he was taking care of his dad. Well, his, la- his dad liked to, to sneak up on him and scare him just for kicks. Mm-hmm. So he'd come up to behind him, and he'd be like, hey, how's it going? And, and it scared him every day. I mean, every day he was just under this constant stress of not knowing when he was going to get scared. And so uh, anyway, in his case, that was enough stress for, for, for it to get to him after a while. And his temperature dropped and his health started to fail. And so anyway, but when we got his temperature up, he felt a lot better. So it could be anything. It could be any kind of emotional or mental or physical stress. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's uh, like toxins, too. Oh, they definitely. Get from that. Yeah, definitely. So toxins yeah. can affect, uh, they can affect both thyroid hormone supply and conversion. And there's a lot of people. So the whole system. Yes. There's a lot of people, and, you know, um, you know, we're all toxic, I believe. Um, Dr. Pizzorno is an expert in the field. He wrote, recently wrote a book called The Toxins, Toxic Solution, I think. Toxin Solution really good book but anyway he points out how we're all toxic now and you really need to have some kind of active detoxification program involved mm-hmm. and uh, a lot of things you could do with that yeah you've got pretty much plastics everywhere and then all the heavy metals that come from your mother as well yeah, yeah. there's just no way getting around it <laughs> absolutely <laughs> yeah so what are the problems with giving just straight up T4 that's that's mostly the what they do at at doctors yeah well I'd say that um, there's for for some people that have no I I personally I'm not against T4 as long as a person's temperature is normal okay so like there's some people who have let's say they um, have no thyroid gland or let's say they have hypothyroidism and you give them T4 and they're, you give them that supply, and their conversion's okay, and their temperature's fine. That that could be fine. That could be fine for years. That's that's that could be great. However, it's kind of, can be a problem though when you give somebody that has a low temperature, like a lot of I w- I would say probably most people on T4 right now, probably most people on thyroid medicine do have low temperatures, mm-hmm. and um, if not most, then you know probably at least half have. Um, have low temperatures even though they're on T4. And the problem with that is if they have a normal TSH and they have a low temperature, it indicates they probably have a conversion problem. And the bad news about that is that the deiodinase enzyme is is under regulation. It's uh, um, down-regulated. It's... it's um, metabolized I'm trying to proteolized it's it's destroyed by something called the ubiquitin proteasome pathway mm-hmm. and um, you don't and, and the, unfortunately one of the things that really speeds the destruction of that converting enzyme is T4 T4 and reverse T3 uh, rapidly or greatly encourage the destruction of the deiodinase enzyme that's in With, a negative feedback Thank yeah you. okay yeah. And so it's kind of like the body is already in, in conservation mode. It's already trying to slow down for whatever reason. And then you give it, 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 in other words, it's already a conversion problem. It's already trying to slow down what you're, it's already trying to slow down the supply that you're giving. And then when you give more supply, the body says, oh, here comes more supply. Let's slow down even further. Mm-hmm. So, so adding the T4 actually just worsens the conversion problem, and sometimes people get worse when you give them T4. And when you increase the dose, typical story, and I know that some of the people on your podcast can relate to this, typical story is that if you, if you have a person on thyroid medicine, a lot of times they'll say, you know, every time they increase the dose, I feel good for two to three months, and then I feel worse again. Yeah. And then they increase the dose. I feel good for two or three months. And I feel worse again until I feel worse right off the. Then they increase it and I feel worse right off the bat. So that's a typical story. And that's because they're being pushed too far in the wrong direction with the wrong medicine. Yeah. It's, it's, it's bad. Yeah. Uh, I, I forgot to ask this before. When we were talking about um, weight gain. What, what about those who, with, who are with low body temperature uh, but are skinny and have trouble gaining weight? Is T3 going to help that? It can. I've had patients like that, and I and I just speculate that 
it's because, you know, having a low temperature affects different people in different ways. For some persons, you know, one guy, his only symptom was a skin problem. His skin was flaking so bad that it was cracking and oozing and he was practically freezing to death in the air conditioning. Mm-hmm. Yes, and yeah. uh, he really looked like he had been exhumed, like taken out of the grave because his skin was flaking that bad. It looked awful. Ah, yeah. And that was his only symptom. And we, we, um, when he left, the, when he would get up from the waiting room and come back to the exam room, where he would be sitting, there would just be like a puddle of skin. And, and I don't mean like a puddle, like liquid. I mean flakes of skin all around where he was sitting. Oh, wow. So, I mean, it was like really bad, but that was his only symptom. Well, someone else, they might have hair loss and somebody else might have malabsorption. Somebody else might have irritable bowel syndrome. And so I think some, some of these people, it affects their gut and you know, affects what they can digest or absorb. And so, which might explain, you know, why they can't gain weight. Mm-hmm. I, I, don't, I, I don't know for sure what the deal is, but I, I have seen a lady... I have seen people where you normalize their temperature and then they, they, they're able to gain weight and they feel a lot better. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. So it kind of all goes back to maybe the inflammation driving it all. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Which kind of brings me to my next topic. What about uh, having uh, high thyroid peroxidase antibodies? Well, um, I'll come right back to that. But one thing, Jake, that I'm going to hit right now because so I don't forget it, because mm-hmm. uh, I think you'll find it interesting, is that um, there are certain herbs that help thyroid function. And um, they're like Google myrrh and uh, triphala fruit and blue flag iris and ashwagandha and different herbs like that that are really helpful for thyroid function, both supply and conversion. And what's fascinating about that. Jacob, is that those plants are almost all anti-inflammatory. So it's just really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like if you say, oh, I mean, say, oh, take these thyroid herbs. That's almost synonymous with saying, okay, here, take these anti-inflammatory herbs, because that's pretty much that's pretty much what it is. is so dual action. Well. Well, what, I guess the point I'm or, trying or is to... It, you're saying it's decreasing the inflammation, therefore allowing the thyroid to act properly. Exactly. I mean, I just think it's real coincidental that, you know, a, a handful of anti-inflammatory herbs are just so happen to be really good for the thyroid, mm-hmm. you know, which is... Uh, so, I mean, it's basically... Um, suggests that, that um, a lot of what happens, of course... Inflammation and autoimmunity are basically synonymous. That's, you know, chronic inflammation or pathological inflammation is another word for autoimmunity. It just so happens that the thyroid gland is the gland that's most or the organ that's most affected by autoimmune disease, or in other words, the organ that's most affected by inflammation. Yeah. So, okay, so you give them, you give these people anti inflammatory herbs and their thyroid gets better. Which is, totally makes sense because it's all inflammation. So it just it just confirms your theory or your feeling that that you know a lot of what's going on in the thyroid system is due to inflammation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, let's let's talk let's talk a little bit about that now. Uh, Hashimoto's autoimmunity. What what's going on? This let let's let's do a quick but in depth lesson of how the the inflammation uh, of the immune system how the immune system is causing inflammation. So things like cytokines, chemokines, interleukins, Tregs, nuclear factor kappa beta, um, bringing that whole process in downward cascade. Okay. Well, as you, as you alluded, I mean, there's, there's a lot of factors and it it would be uh, probably outside the scope of a large textbook to go through them all, but uh, you know, and and how they're affected. But in uh, like you say, a good a good quick lesson is that um, there's a lot of things that that affect inflammation. I mean, one of the things is obesity. Just obesity by itself increases inflammation. Um, just getting just a high fat meal, just one high fat meal will increase um, chemokines and and uh, the the uh, the interleukins and the and the factors that you were mentioning. Um, 
also gut gut permeability, um, mm-hmm. microbiomes, microbiota. You know, if somebody has uh, food allergies, if they have gluten sensitivity, if they eat something they shouldn't, and it starts opening up gaps in their in their gut, and they start getting stuff passing into their bloodstream that that triggers inflammation. You know, and all the things that you talk about. So that you know how that affects the thyroid is. Uh, I mean, part of that is. You know, oxidative stress, toxins. You have you have toxins in the um, causing causing damage, and that damage, and you can have that damage happening in the thyroid gland, and that damage con- contributes to um, an immune response, and that immune response can get out of hand and become Hashimoto's. Um, there's some people that um, they don't have enough glutathione or they don't have enough uh, reductive capacity. Their their oxidative potential is being used up basically by by the toxins. Your body's so worried fighting toxins that you don't have enough um, enough of what it takes to to uh, keep out the toxins of or damage from your own um, own system. Mm-hmm. Anyway, selenium helps rebuild the glutathione, right? Exactly yeah. right. So there's uh, glutathione peroxidase is uh, an enzyme very very important in um, getting rid of peroxide, which which uh, damages the cell. And um, right in the center of that is the selenium. Right in the center of that enzyme is the selenium, as you mentioned. So um, yeah, that's a that's a big that's a big topic. Um, any other thoughts you want to cover on that? Um, so in the gut, you're getting inflammation by little particles uh, and bacterial enzymes like lip- lipopolysaccharides activating toll-like receptors. Um, yeah. In simple terms, what I like to Yeah, is- I'm, I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, one thing I like to think of it is, you know, uh, you know, autoimmunity or good immune function is all about knowing the difference between you and not you. Mm-hmm. Like what's, what's in you, what's what's what belongs there and what doesn't belong there. And um, you know, if you think about what separates, uh, for me, I just think this is interesting. If you know, if you if think about what separates you from not you, most people would think about the skin. You know, the, the skin is where I start and where you stop. You know, you end there and I begin here and right here at the skin. Well, the skin is that barrier between us and not us, for sure. But one thing that's even more so is the is the gut, because there's an opening, you know, from your mouth to your anus that, you know, you put stuff that's not you into your body and it passes through your digestive system and it comes out the other end. But in that process, you have like a, a sieve. Your gut is basically like a sieve. I mean, if your if your skin is like a barrier or a wall, your gut is like a, a toll a toll gate or a receptor, or it's like a, what's the word? I'm trying to think of uh, it's like a a border checkpoint or something that 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 decides whether you're going to some some of that's going to be let into your body to become your body or not. Mm-hmm. And so that's crucial. You can see how crucial that is. I mean, because if, if something happens there where stuff that's not you starts getting permission to come in and be you and cause all kinds of problems, you could see that could be really devastating. So, so anyway, yeah, I think that's what, you know, that's what happens. And it can happen with inflammation. And that can start with something as simple as something you're eating. You know, if, you're, if you have a food allergy and you're eating something that you're allergic to, that could cause a lot of problems, and uh, and a lot of people like are sensitive to gluten these days, and and there is a strong association between gluten intake and um, Hashimoto's. I mean, not everybody has it for that reason, but it is a big deal in some people. Mm-hmm. That uh, the protein in gluten looks a lot like thyroid hormone or the thyroid itself, or parts um, of the thyroid. Yeah, the gly- gliadin, or yeah, I'm not. Um, I know that some of the some of the toxins look like thyroid. I can't remember if that if that gluten one looks like it or not. But I do know that um, your, your body is, um, you know, people 
um, are sensitive to that and it damages the, the gut and, and it opens up holes in the gut. Basically, uh, the, the tight junctions that should be tight aren't tight anymore mm-hmm. due to that inflammation. And then, and then you start getting a vicious cycle of inflammation and autoimmunity and it just gets worse and worse. And so markers like the thyroid peroxidase and antibodies would rise. Yeah, exactly. The thyroid peroxidase is an enzyme that attaches the iodine to thyroglobulin and the production of thyroid hormone. It's something that's up inside the thyroid gland. And when there's damage inside the, um, the follicular cell of the thyroid, the, the thyroid peroxidase enzyme is, um, is on the membrane, the follicular membrane between the follicle and the uh, follicular cell. But anyway, when that when that TP, when that area gets injured, then uh, somehow that can make it attractive to our immune system, and then all of a sudden we're making antibodies against thyroid peroxidase, and then our our, our quote unquote TPO antibodies start going up. So, yeah, high TPO antibodies can be found in Hashimoto's, and they can also be found in other autoimmune diseases, which is kind of interesting. So, some people with lupus, for example, will have high TPO antibodies. So, like. Immune disorders that affect one thing are oftentimes a part of a broader picture that's affecting more organs than just one. That makes sense. It definitely makes sense. They're all connected. Yeah. So, uh, so we look at when we're tra- treating the thyroid. You look at body temperature because it's the measuring the energy of the system. Uh, and normally, you look at all the vital signs like uh, respiratory rate, heart rate. Um, cause those are also, uh, energy signs. Yes. Um, so what's going on with, so low body temperature. Okay. Uh, so what is your, your protocol? Wilson's well, temperature syndrome protocol. Normally what we do with, um, <clears throat> if somebody comes in and they have thyroid complaints, mm-hmm. uh, first thing, you know, we, we, um, you know, how, how do you know their temperature is right or not? Well, we have them take their temperature. Mm-hmm. And the way you measure your temperature is by mouth using an oral thermometer. So, like, um, and we don't have them take their temperature in the morning when they first wake up because it's more likely to be normal then. What we have them do is take it every three hours, three times a day, starting three hours after they wake up. Mm-hmm. And um, studies have shown that that's when it's more likely to see a, a discrepancy between someone that's normal and someone that's abnormal. And so their temperature could be like a degree below normal during that day. So you, what you do is you add up the temperatures, divide by three, get a baseline. The, just two or three days of temperatures is usually enough to make a diagnosis. So while you're awake? Yes, it is. So, like, if a person woke up at 7 o'clock in the morning, mm-hmm. they could mm-hmm. take their temperature at 10, 1, and 4. 10, 10, 10, 1, and then 1 and 4 p.m. And then um, if their temperature, even like 98, anything less than 98.6 could explain symptoms, even 98.4, 98.2, but it's usually a moot point because people that have low temperatures, more than 90% of the time, their temperature is 98 or lower. So it's usually like 97.8, or it could be 96 or 95 or 94. So, yeah, we have them take their temperatures. And then the protocol is uh, we, we look at why they have a low temperature. It's either going to be supply or it's going to be conversion. So we look at the TSH to see what the supply is like, if that's fine, and they still have a temperature problem. Then we start thinking about Wilson's syndrome, and then we start thinking about how we can improve conversion. And a couple ways to do that, sometimes we start with herbs and nutrients like like uh, Google myrrh, like I spoke of, or um, blue flag, or trifalla root, or uh, trifalla fruit, or selenium and zinc, iodine. So sometimes we'll give them supplements, and we actually dose those supplements according to body temperature. So after so after a week, if their temperature is still low, you know we would we could increase the dose from there. So. Um, so that's one thing. And then we'll usually try that for like three weeks or a month. And if their temperature does great on that, then great. But if not, then we consider 
uh, adding T3. Of course, you could add T3 on day one if you wanted, but uh, the way we dose that, I've got a, a website called wilsonsyndrome.com, and there's a video tab, and on that video tab, it explains a simplified protocol and it has like a little handout sheet. And there's like eight videos there, but basically, you, you start on a 7.5 micrograms twice a day, and then every day you increase from 15, like the next day you would increase 15 twice a day. As long as the body, as long as the pulse is still not above 100, you could increase to 22.5 and 30 and 37.5 and you keep going up to as long as your pulse is not um, above 100. That makes sense. <laughs> what about using something uh, like uh, low dose naltrexone? Yeah, that that's a... Uh, a really interesting uh, thing. Um, I'm not sure it would really help conversion so much. I'm not sure anybody's tried it for that, but I do know they tried it for Hashimoto's, and I've heard of doctors getting good results with that, uh, using up to like starting about 1.5 milligrams a day, maybe going up to you know three or four or five milligrams a day, and um, so. You know, that can decrease autoimmunity and it can make a big difference in some people. Some people, you know, really like that. Mm -hmm. What other tests do people want to get? Well, um, they it's a good idea to check their iron and their ferritin levels. Uh, that can affect thyroid function, of course. Um, thyroid, thyroid disease, I guess, in my mind, a lot largely is a, is a diagnosis of exclusion. So you want to make sure they don't, you, you can get tests to rule out liver disease, anemia, you can rule out leukemia, kidney disease. Um, so you, you get a normal complete blood count, you get a normal uh, multiple chemistry test to, to, to rule out all these things. And a lot of these people are told by doctors after they do all these tests, doctors say, well, your tests are all normal. There's nothing wrong with you. You know, have a day. You're, you're perfect. You know, I've got great news. Your, 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 your tests are all normal and you're perfectly healthy and now you can, you know, go enjoy your life. You know, and they're like, I mean, every one of them. I've had one patient, she went to a research hospital. I won't mention which one, but believe me, you know, if I said the name, you would think, oh, this is the, the most, this is like the top of the food chain. This is the best research you know for everything <laughs> you could ever go to. Yeah. She got $30,000 workup. Holy crap. This was like the third opinion. She had already gone to her, her family doctor, already gone to an endocrinologist, knew there had to be a problem. So she went to, you know, the, the ivory tower to, mm -hmm. to get a definitive scoop on what the deal was. They did a thirty thousand dollar workup, and they 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 comforted her with the knowledge that she was completely fine. She was completely normal, and of course uh, she was just still miserable. Had all the symptoms. Came to my office, and um, I gave her a six dollar thermometer to go home and see what her temperature was, <laughs> and it was low. She had a really low temperature, and she started taking T3, and within two or three weeks, all of her symptoms were gone. So, a, you know. a twenty-nine thousand dollar nine hundred ninety-four difference. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, <laughs> so it doesn't have to be a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, what what other? So you can add T3. You can take uh, herbs to help with hormones. What about? things for you said most of these herbs are working as anti-inflammatories um what are, what are some other supplements that aren't herbs you said iron and selenium yeah uh, iodine and selenium sorry yeah iodine um let's see zinc is a good cofactor to take um as um as far as, uh, I mean, ferritin, iron stores can be important in thyroid function. Um, let's see. 
trying to think, I'm kind of blanking a little. I mean, there's basically anything that can affect your health can affect thyroid function because when you're when you're not healthy, it puts a strain on your body and it puts a stress on your system, and that's one of the things that can shut down T4 to T3 conversion. So basically, anything you can do to establish good health is going to help your thyroid function and your conversion. So, you know, good exercise. Yeah. So let's talk about the lifestyle. Yeah. Exactly. So you you want you want exercise, you know, uh, good exercise. Rest is important. Um, circadian rhythms are important, and uh, <laughs> having that all dialed in. And um, uh, what about diet? Yeah, diet is huge. Like you want to, you know, avoid processed foods and super refined foods. Um, you want. Uh, Sometimes people do well without dairy. Um, definitely, you know, you want to avoid refined carbohydrates, for example. I mean, sometimes people in low temperatures or, you know, some people get candida infections and um, they just have low-grade candida all the time. And uh, sometimes... Um, Anyway, just just getting rid of the sugar, and I, I've seen people that just got sugar out of their diet, and they recovered dramatically from that. Just just getting rid of white flour, mm -hmm. just get rid of sugar, and um, just getting their amalgams removed. Sometimes your temperature will oh, yeah, go. That's toxic. Yeah, just getting rid of a, a heavy metal out of your mouth or whatever can 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 normalize your temperature. Uh, so yeah. Uh, what about uh, like fasting? Is that better or worse for well, the thyroid? You know, that's a really good question, Jacob. And because there, there's studies saying that it helps the immune system, but there's also studies saying that it's going to decrease your body temperature. Right. And um, yeah, I, I, I totally, uh, I totally get that. And um, I think that there's. Um, In my mind, there's like, um, there's, I mean, I think it can do both. I mean, I think fasting, fasting per se can, and fasting is known to be something that shuts down T4 to T3 conversion or, or reduces it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, definitely can be one of the, you know, yo-yo dieting can definitely contribute to slower and slower metabolism. You know, some people can go on uh protein sparing modified liquid diets or whatever and they can get persistent slowing of their me metabolic rate and it can get worse with with each episode and that that's true um but there's a um, but on the other hand there's um there's uh decreasing the amount you eat like going periods of time without food can be awesome because it puts the gut at rest for example and you know, it's like, is your arm, is your broken arm going to heal if you if you don't put a cast on it and you keep using it to play tennis? Yeah. You know, maybe not. You know, and so so likewise, is your gut going to heal if you keep eating? You know, uh, six meals a day, twenty four seven. You know, or whatever, just day in and day out, and you just <laughs> that's ridiculous. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, you just keep packing it in, packing it in. Yeah, I mean, you have to give. I mean, you, you it, it's. I've I've heard one doctor, she she puts almost all of her patients that have really really bad thyroid health or thyroid problems, she'll put them on a 21 day water fast. Oh wow, and which is gruesome. But a lot of these people, it has completely turned their lives around, because it's totally re re recalibrated their their dietary thoughts and their whole attitudes towards food, and um, so. A lot of things can um, be so. Anyway, I think there's I think there's a right way and a wrong way to go about it, and a right way and a wrong way to control your your hormones and, and your in your health. And but I think meal timing, like you're talking about, like how much time intermittent fasting, right? Yeah. So like how much time you spend. I do think it's you know I do think it can be problematic to to be eating all the time, like, you know, snacking between meals and everything like that, because you can have, that can, that's a good way to keep your insulin levels up and hyperinsulinemia is, 
is a big contributor to inflammation mm -hmm. and, uh, and um, oxidative stress. Yeah, definitely. That makes sense. And, and obesity and, and ad, uh, central obesity and, you know, central fat and, you know, that's not a, a good good thing. Yeah. Have you tried using uh, the sun to increase thyroid hormones? Um, the sun, not not really. I haven't okay. really tested that. So the research I've done, uh, infra infrared helps with thyroid function and yeah. uh, UV. So if you go out right in the morning and get some infrared uh, on your thyroid, try to get it around there, it helps kick it into gear along with seeing it visibly. And then also UV during the day increases a hormone called melanocyte stimulating hormone. And yeah. melanites, mel uh, MSH also increases uh, TRH. Oh, wow. That's kind of neat. Yeah, that is. And then on top of the sun has properties of uh, decreasing inflammation. Yeah, vitamin D, right? Uh, yeah, vitamin D. But uh, MSH has a ton of properties for de decreasing inflammation. Okay. Yeah. Usually when you see an autoimmune patient, uh, they have decreased MSH. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And so, so you would recommend pretty much every autoimmune person to get a little bit more sun then? I think everyone <laughs> ever needs more sun, unless you live next to the equator. Okay. Uh, need more sun. Well, you live in a good place for that. Yeah. Are you in Florida as well? <laughs> I am. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you have great tan. Oh, thanks. There's a, uh, a good app called uh, D-Minder that uses your GPS and tells yeah. you when uh, when it's uh, solar noon, so the most UV. Okay. Yeah, and it tracks your vitamin D as well. So I use that to track everything. I don't take any hormones, uh, like as in pills or anything. Cool. Yeah, something to check out. So where can people find you if they, they want to contact you? You said wilsonsyndrome.com? Yes, there's uh, that, that's a good place to refer. And... Um, Physicians, if you have, if there's physicians, you know, uh, on the podcast and they want to uh, look into more, what we have is uh, restorativeformulations.com. Okay. Restorativeformulations.com, and and um, we have uh, some herbs and supplements on that. And that's awesome. Another one is restorativemedicine.org. Restorative medicine. Dot, I'm sorry. Restorative medicine. Let's say that um, that one is all about educational opportunities. Like we have a we have a, a meeting coming up next month in Miami, May 20th, and then there's one in um, Tucson, Arizona, in October. So if doctors interested in conferences and stuff. We've got some excellent conferences. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and be sure to check out your newest book yeah thanks yeah we have a journal of restorative medicine as well okay i'll put that all in the description below so they can get okay. that all right thank you for coming on this is all awesome, right. dr wilson thank you jacob great um picked up some things appreciate it awesome i've got i've got some more stuff to look at too from you <laughs> take care thanks